thanks for having me here today. I'm really excited. You're going to hear some topics that I'm pretty passionate about. Um, and I promise if I start going too quick, stop me. Ask some questions. If there are things you got, need to uh, dive into a little bit deeper. But as we jump in, um, I have maybe just a little bit of background, more for context of where you're going to see a lot of my examples coming from. So I grew up uh, in pharmaceuticals. I do a lot of product quality and compliance, uh, FDA, regulatory, really fun stuff. Um, but maybe it was, man, like seven, eight years ago, we were working on a lot of supply chain uh, serialization, track and trace uh, components, and we thought, started thinking, boy, maybe, maybe blockchains can help us solve some of these big global um, issues that we have. And so that's what put me down the rabbit hole of looking at blockchain for a supply chain. And I've been super fortunate over the past uh, maybe two or three years to start working with some of the awesome folks at Protocol Labs and Filecoin to figure out how are we going to start um, actually making this stuff work, All right? So uh, the missing link, blockchain solutions for supply chain management, kind of a fancy title. Nothing can really fix supply chain too much, but um, I think we're going to see a few of the things that, um, that I've been working on at least. So if we can go into that next slide. So uh, working for one of the largest audit and accounting firms in the world, here's my obligatory disclaimer. Uh, these are my own personal views. They do not represent that of the firm. Uh, and there's some statistics that I pulled together here that are probably not totally correct, but you'll get the point when we get there. All right. So this is what I spend all my time every day doing, this kind of simple little picture here, right? Uh, Vastly oversimplified, but it has all the core components of what we're trying to do uh, in supply chain. There's a couple bullet points underneath there. I'm not going to reiterate too much of that. And, and, and the point of my topic today isn't necessarily to get into how this is going to work. But the idea is that we use tokens to represent products. And as those products move through their life cycle, um, we can track them on a blockchain, on a public blockchain, under privacy. And there's a few key things that are worth noting here. We have to mint tokens. We have to transfer tokens. Eventually, when the product's consumed, we get to burn tokens. And we're trying to figure out how do we string all of this together so that um, at the end, when a consumer is taking a product and that token gets burned, the manufacturer can actually see it. And as simple as that kind of sounds, that's a really difficult problem to solve today. Uh, and it's actually even hard to do under, under blockchain, too. Uh, but we're making progress. One piece I left out, which is actually the point of the topic today, is that signing the metadata, right? So we don't put much information on chain, a token ID, whatever we can pack in the URI field. But that URI is usually pointing to some off-chain metadata. And on this picture, I only show it here just once. But uh, actually what happens over the course of the life cycle of these products is there are many signings of metadata pieces. And you can almost think of that metadata as like breadcrumbs about a product. So it could be everything that's like on the product label, or it could be sometimes like detailed research that went into producing that product that has to be made available at some other point, right? And we create the linkage through the URI. It usually points to somewhere out on IPFS. There's other ways that we're doing it, but that's what we're pushing everyone to use here. Um, it's a content identifier. But what we haven't put a whole lot of thought into yet is how much metadata is going to get generated doing this. So this is where I ran some probably not so accurate stats, but I think this is, this, you'll, you'll see where it's heading. All right. 2022, in the US, 6.7 billion prescriptions were filled. All right. So let's think of each one of those as a product token, in a way, because that's the lowest saleable unit or the lowest consumable unit. So under that model that I was just describing, we would have 6.7 billion tokens. All right. That's a lot. By the way, topic for another discussion, but I threw it in here anyways because it is concerning. When you start to scale that out, you're looking at upwards of 100 million daily transactions. Right? If you think one of those products changes hands three, four, five times, that's a lot. All right? And that's just pharma products. But the metadata, the metadata is not big. We store these things in little JSON blobs. Um, I looked at a couple of our bigger ones, and they were like five kilobytes. All right? I've seen some get, get pretty significant if we have a lot of information in there, but they're not that big. So you figure one of those tokens maybe signing three blobs um, across its whole life cycle, and you start doing some of the math here. You're starting to look at 
about 12 and a half terabytes, 11.4 TIBs. The more I work with the protocol labs folks, they keep making me use TIBs instead of terabytes. So um, about 11.4 TIBs. And that's just for pharma. Pharma is about a quarter of the global, or the US is about a quarter of the global pharma distribution. So you can multiply that by four. And pharma is about 10% of global supply chain. That's probably actually low. So you're looking at about 456 TIBs for a year that has to be stored for at least 10 years, all right? So when we start doing the math at that level, now you're starting to get into the scale of the things that Filecoin's trying to achieve. Because this is data that needs to be stored in perpetuity. We need to be able to show that it hasn't changed. It needs to be highly available by who knows who in 10 some years, and it's just gonna keep growing. And I'd be willing to bet that that is a grossly low estimate on where all of these pieces are going to go. So when I was trying to think through like EY's role in the Decentralized Storage Alliance and, and how we want to bring this stuff to enterprises, this is, in my opinion, the, one of the first places where we're going to see enterprise adoption going into these decentralized networks. Because to be able to uh, prove that you're holding that data and making it available for a long period of time is not necessarily something that enterprises want to sign up for. So I said I would pause and stop for questions throughout. If there are any questions, now's a good, now's a good stop here. Does stuff make sense so far? You believe in this piece of it? All right, because it gets even better. <laughs> when we do go and talk to our enterprise clients about how they want to use Filecoin, it always comes back to enterprise data monetization. Right, so that vision of the metadata and the, and the product tokens, that's getting a lot of the regulators and the industry groups, uh, manufacturers included, really excited, but not so much for the data storage components because of the visibility it gives them into their, into their processes. When they look at the data, they say, well, we want to figure out how to make money from the data that we have, right? Uh, actually, I overheard this the other day. Uh, EY, my firm, has 11 petabytes of audit data which isn't surprising. I mean, we audit a lot of companies. That's a lot of data, right? Um, the problem is this stuff has been gathered over years and years and years, especially if you're back on that pharma side doing clinical research. They collect that stuff. They, it's, I mean, a lot of clinical studies are 30, 40 years old, and they're still relying on some of the information that was gathered back in those early studies. So the data's kind of stuck where it is, and enterprises aren't, they haven't, when they were collecting it, this idea of being able to compute over it and do different things with it later wasn't quite there. And so it's really like kind of siloed. And this is one of the big problems that we're trying to help figure out how to solve. How do you tap into that? I've done a lot of work with data lakes and migrations and things along these lines. That is all to try to get access to data that's already just sitting there within the enterprise. And then what we find is the stuff that people want to actually buy, the stuff that there's a market for, is highly sensitive, right? They will want like patient information and demographics, all kinds of the personal stuff that's been collected about you that they're not supposed to collect. That's what people want to buy, right? So it's very sensitive and highly restrictive. We have to figure out how can we actually create access to some of these things. Um, and that's part of the other problem. The good data tends to be really siloed and not necessarily part of that data lake where it's easy to get access to. And so now we have to start connecting all these different dots together. I'm hopeful to see a world where decentralized storage starts filling that gap much better than the big data aggregators and, 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 and consolidators in that space. Um, none of this would work if we weren't paying attention though to all the regulations and rules around what you can do with that data in the first place, right? So this has been a challenge it's been a challenge for years, but um, even since GDPR was passed in Europe, that's, that's the regulation that gives you, like a consumer, the right to be forgotten, right? The idea that, hey, if you've collected my data, I could call you up, whoever you are, and say, I want you to wipe my records out. That's, that's law in Europe, it's becoming law in the US. If you put your data on a blockchain, you're kind of sunk, because <laughs> you can't do that. Um, but when we have decentralized storage and that data is all over the place, who's gonna handle those kind of requests? Storage providers? 
right? Like how is this stuff gonna come through? So we have to think through a lot of these compliance um, pieces to try to figure out like, how are storage providers gonna help their clients who are gonna be enterprises navigate that whole regulatory landscape, all right? Traditionally, if we thought of a storage provider as a third party like service provider, like uh, Amazon or uh, like if you're putting your stuff out in S3, you would say, hey, here's the controls I expect you to have in place. Give me a re show me that those controls are there, all right? We call that a, a SOC report or um, there's all different kinds of attestations that you can do. There's ISO certifications, things along these lines. That's how we get comfortable with big enterprise um, storage providers. But are we gonna be able to do that with smaller storage providers? Or if we ever get to the vision of the storage providers just being that market and almost anonymous, you don't really know who they are. How are you gonna trust that they can actually have those right controls in place to control your data? It's gonna be tricky. I think in the, in the early phases, and I know we're, we're, we're working on a few uh, cases with this, we can do it the traditional way, right? We can issue SOC reports for a few storage providers, but it's gonna be really hard for us to do that um, across the board and make that just almost like part of the fabric when you're negotiating with an SP of, hey, you have to be able to prove you have these certifications. The other piece, and I put this on here just because it comes up like all the time. Um, I'll get clients that say, hey, I wanna do something with Filecoin because we think this is the future, but do I have to hold Filecoin because I'm not allowed to do that, <laughs> right? So uh, just for like a point of reference, it took me at EY almost a year and a half, I think, to get an institutional account set up to manage crypto. And it wasn't because we didn't know how to do it. We, we do these services for our clients all the time. It was because our own internal treasury uh, hasn't opened up a bank account in 50 years. The last person to do that is long gone, right? Like big institutions don't establish new banking relationships often. And to hold crypto, you have to have a new banking relationship. So this is a bigger barrier than people think because we, we live in this world where it's like, oh, you get a wallet, right? Or go to Coinbase, they have services for this. It's not that easy, right? And then once they're holding it and they have to figure out how to account for it and pay a storage provider in fill, that's actually a hard thing to do. So I do think there's an opportunity um, to figure out how we can bridge this gap between these existing solutions that are based around fiat currency. Like we've optimized procurement for fiat for, for, for years, right? How do we bridge the gap between something that's fiat based and hopefully lead them to the crypto, right? But if we say you have to pay and fill upfront, it's gonna be a challenge, we know that. And I know I'm moving kind of quick through the slides, so think through some questions too, you can save some for the end. But this dives into some of those challenges a little bit more. There's probably nothing here that hasn't gone through everyone's minds before if you're dealing with the centralized storage. These are kind of like the bread and butter use cases, the things that we've been talking about for years. But these are the ones that our enterprise clients are bringing to us to say, help us figure out how to do some of it. So I've talked a little bit about these, um, just kind of in bits and pieces before, but that first one, tapping into the old data, being able to unlock old data and train your, uh, train your learning models against it, that's like massive, but we just can't get to it, all right? If we had structured the old databases using SIDs and CARs and all the fun IPFS stuff, it would be far easier. So maybe it's a discussion about migrating some of that old data into a decentralized network so we could train on it easier. Right? I do think there's gonna be quite a bit that starts coming in uh, to that, but the first one's only gonna play into uh, really the last two. Um, and actually, I'll come back to the divestitures one because I think there's a real big opportunity here if we can figure out how to do it right. That third part about selling access to the rich data sets, that's what everyone's trying to do. They're trying to say, hey, I've, I'm, a, I'm a pharmaceutical research company. I've been doing clinical studies for years. I have huge piles of really good science that I probably didn't use, right? A lot of it never even makes it to market. Those drugs never get passed. But it was all collected. It was all done correctly. It was done well. How can they tap into that? How can they kind of sell that stuff, right? That's what all the pharmas are trying to do. And it turns out it's really hard because it's super sensitive. You can't just put it out there for other people to access. 
if they put it up on, uh, I like Ocean Protocol, I think they're doing some really cool stuff. If they put it out there on Ocean, they would get sued in a heartbeat, right? Like that's not how you can exchange that kind of data. So we really have to think about structuring it in a way where the last box can, can unlock, right? Where we can let other organizations compute over the data, not necessarily get access to the sensitive components of it, but return back really good learnings for their algorithms. That's what they're after the data for in the first place. Um, and be able to use that to generate new insights. And actually, and I think in that little component too, there's this idea that if I have a data set and maybe it's really good, maybe it's really rich, it's, 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 it's valid, it has a lot of information, but if I only had this other piece of, of uh, info about each one of the, I don't know, patients in my, in my study, it'd be worth 10 times more. That's a very common discussion, right? They're gonna say, this is great, but if you had this demographic, it would help us fit this study in this, in this thing that we're looking for. So then you have to go back and you have to find other data sets that might have that and try to match them up. And that being able to combine data sets to make them more valuable and then sell the compute over it, that's gonna be an industry in and of itself. And it's starting to happen now, right? We're seeing these companies start to put the pieces together there. But it's still pretty early. Um, I don't know of many companies that are comfortable with compute over data and how are you accessing something that's required by some local regulations to stay within the borders of this country, yet you're training on it somewhere else and using that information. So we're gonna see that one unfold. I think that one's really exciting. But before we move on, I wanted to come back to the divestiture, divestiture thing, because this is kind of interesting too. And in terms of a mashup, by the way, this has nothing to do with supply chain, which I know the topic was for, but this one's interesting from an enterprise perspective, right? When companies are looking to split up or um, sell off a division, let's just say, uh, actually Johnson & Johnson is a good example. They, uh, they spun off their consumer products division. Now it's called uh, Kenview. It's not fully separated, but uh, J&J, what are they, 150-year-old organization, had always had the, the three units together. Now they've, now they've spun one off. Disentangling data in a spinoff like that is really hard to do. But what's happening more and more and more, the data that the companies own is a major part of their valuation. That's actually why companies, other companies want to buy them. So not necessarily because, well, j and is maybe not a good example there. They're going for the brand and the, and the name. But very often when people spin off smaller units of their business, they get bought because of the data that they have. All right? And this gets really hard. Because how do you then go and like peel this stuff out? If everyone had been using IPFS forever, it wouldn't be too difficult, right? Because we could figure out where that structure is and we can kind of split the, cart, the, the, the packages and say, oh, this is now yours. Oh, and even better, I don't even have to move the data. I just have to like give you the keys, all right? That's a, that's a big deal. What happens today is they sell a division, maybe to a private equity firm, or maybe it spins out on its own. And the very first deal that that new division does is a contract back to the company selling them to support access to the data for some period of time. And those contracts are expensive. They're not fun for the company that just spun off because now they're beholden to the company they came from. And they're not fun for the company that they came from because they really just were trying to like push that company out and move on. And so those TPS agreements take a long time to resolve. And sometimes they're locked in for years and years and years. So just in terms of where I think we're gonna see this mashup of enterprise and decentralized storage, it's gonna come not necessarily around cheaper ways to store big data sets. We have cheap ways to kind of do that. It's gonna come around different ways to store the data, different ways to access the data, different ways to mesh the data together, and different ways to turn it into something that you can monetize uh, or make your big transactions even easier. So the supply chain stuff I think is going to really change the world in terms of what we do from a product and a visibility perspective, especially in pharma. It's, it's needed in food safety. It's very much needed. But these are, I think, the examples where you're going to see the enterprises using the Filecoin network in the near term. So I know I've been begging you guys for questions along here. I want to take one more stop to see if there's something out there that you guys, see if this stuff made sense. Yeah.
Okay, so for anyone that didn't hear, um, the question was around uh, Spade and SP uh, reputation DAOs and ways of uh, like how that kind of overlaps with what I was saying before about certifying SPs. All right? I think it's going to play like really nicely together, but I don't think reputation alone is going to be enough to get enterprises to trust the SPs that they're dealing with. Right? They're used to dealing like one-on-one -on -one with the contracts, and they can deal one-on-one -on -one with SPs as well, but they're going to look for their tried-and-true controls that have been around for a long time. Right? I, I started my career with EY on, like, over 20 years ago now, back when SOX was like a new thing. Right? And we were trying to figure out then how financial controls could be proven for public companies, and very, very quickly we realized that so much of that like so much of the control was actually in their service providers. Uh, payroll is a great example, right? Like most enterprises don't have much control over their payroll. They're relying on ADP to do it for them. So back then there were only a couple of those big service providers and there was a reputation thing. But when the auditors said, hey, we, you have to be able to prove this to us, what that started happening was every one of ADP's customers went to them and said, hey, can you test these controls for us and prove it? Our auditors are asking. And service providers are like, wait, we can't do this like 50, 60 times every year or even more. So standards arose around like what is expected of a service provider to be able to meet financial compliance. And those, back then they were called SAS 70 reports. Those reports actually started becoming used for the reputation of the service provider. So they would, even before they had customers demanding them, they would go out and get these SAS 70s so that they could use that almost like from a marketing perspective of saying, hey, we have a controlled environment, you can trust us. And so when I look at like the reputation down and some of the things that are starting to happen with the SPs, it's another piece of it, right? Those certifications are gonna bolster their reputation and enterprises who are used to seeing certifications are gonna ask for that. So that's where I think those two are gonna overlap. We've seen that story play out a while ago. Cool. And if, yeah. Um, so you're talking about finding more ways to monetize and use data that for these companies that's kind of locked behind these walls. And yeah. so I'm, I'm curious, um, and I might have missed this in your talk, what kind of like technologies are you seeing um, with regards to privacy that would be applicable in this kind of scenario? Because Companies, obviously, you want to protect, sometimes you need to protect user privacy. Yeah. Sometimes you need to only, if it's company to company, you only want to expose certain data. Yeah. Um, I'm, cu I'm curious, you know, there's a lot of new in innovations happening. There, and I can promise you, I'm not keeping up with all the new innovations because that space is going so quick. I remember a couple of years ago when I first learned about like fully homomorphic encryption, and I was like, oh, that's the key, right? I still think it is the key. But there's so many new things that are making that so much easier to do. So what companies are exploring here is we can publish our schemas and we can publish some metadata, pre, well, not metadata is not that, pre-aggregated data, right? So I can give you the schema, I can tell you what my raw data looks like and I can sell a aggregated set of it, which doesn't have any of the sensitive information, right? It'll just have ranges. And that's generally okay, depending if you can get around some other, other rules. And that's just a pure, like, teeing up the data. And in that process, if they go and collect some other data sets, remember the, the piece I said about combining them, that's how they're trying to make things really valuable. The more progressive enterprises are looking at ways of selling access to companies to come and compute and to query that data without returning back, right? And so this is where the, the, the homomorphic encryption comes into play, but also just some of like the zero knowledge querying that, that, that people are now um, starting to play around with. I wouldn't say, I think you have like a couple of years before that's mainstream and enterprise because it takes a long time to understand what that means, right? And to actually, if you're on the receiving end of it, to be able to say, okay, you just gave me back a, a binary yes, no, after I asked you these like long questions, how do I know that's right? Right? Like they have to get comfortable with that kind of math that has to become more commonplace. Or on the uh, sending side of it, proving that you're not leaking data along the way. Right? Um, actually, just pulling on that thread a little bit more too, because this has been coming up more and more. 
with the idea that you have sort of quantum around the corner with some of the encryption, uh, being able to break some of the legacy encryption in this um, kind of concept that you can start to like collect now and decrypt it later uh, sort of thing, we're starting to see even more sensitivity about companies sharing encrypted data sets, right? Because that was actually the answer a few years back. It's like, hey, you want to buy this directory from me, I'll encrypt it and send it to you. But if it can get like grabbed somewhere in transit, at the time they were like, oh, they don't have the, they don't have the keys, they can't decrypt it. But now they're saying, well, maybe they'll have the keys later. So that kind of stuff is starting to get um, suspect too. And it just makes uh, enterprises more entrenched, right? They're, they're less likely to do that. Cool. Good question, though. I got a few more minutes up here before they kick me out. But, yeah. So, uh, I want to know the business reason for cloud client come from me. Hi. Um, this is more of a business question. So, um, there, you, you're, um, there's, a, there's probably a lot of clients coming to EY to get blockchain consultancy. Why are they interested? Why are the brands, enterprises interested in blockchain? Sure. technology and probably more specifically if you can expand on that why are they interested in decentralized technology what's the reason behind that yeah i only have three minutes that's a long yeah. question <laughs> you, you, short answers I'll give you this for example if, if they're driven up they're afraid of future or is driven from risk yeah uh, or some you know I think broadly speaking there's two buckets right so take the financial services industry all the banks all the payments they're, they're, they're scared of the future, right? They see DeFi, they see what's happening with payments, they realize that it's much better than their legacy systems. And so they are trying to do, and for what it's worth, even though like we hear in the news, a lot of the negativity and the, their views on crypto and things, they've been working on this stuff for years, years, right? Um, so they're really anxious on just the blockchain front in general, because it's much better rails than what they currently have. Um, I don't know if you've been following some of the stuff that uh, Chainlink's doing. They, they just did a, a project with Swift, which is the legacy network for banks to communicate with each other, to, to, to start using like Chainlink's protocols across the thing. Like they're gonna get all over that stuff, right? Because it's gonna bridge the gap. It's actually gonna fix a lot of things and it's gonna make banks able to sell assets faster, right? So they're interested in it from that standpoint. I think on the commercial side, uh, and within EY, we kind of separate into three buckets. We have like government, uh, financial services, and commercial. They're not equal buckets, but that's generally how the things kind of fall. Um, on the commercial side, there's the, the interest is mostly driven by the companies that are a little bit visionary and that see this decentralized future as like how they will connect with their customers. Whether that's loyalty programs, whether that's traceability, going back to the patients. There's a lot of those companies saying like, this is where it is, right? It's not all NFTs and crypto payments. It's a way of connecting like companies to their customers. So they're very excited about that. And there's really cool use cases that are coming out of it. Um, the government side is also interesting because they care about all of it, <laughs> right? And they want to understand like, if this is being used, can we use it too? Um, clearly there's a lot of disconnects and things within our, uh, within our uh, government systems, but then it starts crossing over into all the different digital currencies and pieces there too. But I think those are kind of like the three buckets. So you have institutions that realize they'll get disrupted if they don't get on board. Um, you have visionary companies who realize that this is the future and a better way for them to connect with their customers. Right? Some of them are regulated uh, companies, so they have to get the regulators on board with it too. And then you have like, the really big institutions, mostly governments, that are trying to figure out like, how can we piece this stuff together to make like what we're trying to accomplish better? Yeah. So that's the best I could do in three minutes. That's a, that's a long question though. So uh, with that, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for the questions. And uh, I'll be around uh, today and tomorrow too. If you have any more, we can catch up offline.